Hello, everyone. Now, I know that it's hard to keep up on top of what's going on in the Holy Land, but if you want to know more about what's happening here in Israel, I'm Aaron Porras, and this is the Weekly Review. Israelis this week are marking a quarter of a century since the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Every year, hundreds gather in Tel Aviv's Rabin Square on this day to commemorate the former prime minister and the legacy he left behind. Now, with the pandemic affecting all aspects of our lives, we even have to adapt the way we memorialize. So this year, the events are going digital. Take a look. It's been 25 years since the murder of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. He the leader of a country, but also an ideology. His killer opposed his political ideals as he tried to normalize coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. Israeli President Reuven Rivlin lit a candle in honor of the former prime minister at a small memorial ceremony attended only by a few politicians and family members. Benny Gantz was also present and spoke to a divided country about what Rabin represented for him. Normally, each year this anniversary is marked with a ceremony attended by hundreds, but the pandemic has forced its format to change. The channel will allow viewers to interactively build their own playlists in order to create custom ceremonies of their own to watch at home. אז איך זה עובד? הערוץ מחולק למספר קטגוריות של תוכן. למשל, קטעים מוזיקליים, קטעי קריאה, סרטי וידאו וקטעים טקסיים רשמיים. The Ministry of Strategic Affairs is asking Israelis to respect the COVID guidelines and find new ways to remember those we've lost. Nitney Manson, ILTV. Moving on now, following ongoing U.S.-mediated border talks with Lebanon, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a quick visit to Israel's northern border and gave a warning to Hezbollah. Visiting soldiers taking part in a military exercise, he was joined by Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Aviv Kochavi and other senior IDF officials. גם בתקופת הקורונה, האויבים שלנו לא קופים על השמרים, וגם אנחנו לא. אני מתרשם מהתרגיל הזה משיפור עצום ביכולות ההתקפיות של צה"ל, וכדאי שחיזבאללה ומדינת לבנון ייקחו את זה בחשבון. מי שיתקוף אותנו יפגוש עוצמת אש ואגרוף פלדה שישמיד כל אויב. Longtime foes, Israel and Lebanon, are launching a second round of U.S. mediated talks over their disputed sea border. Delegations from Jerusalem and Beirut reconvening at a U.N. peacekeeper base today. According to Israel's energy ministry, they are looking to reach an agreement on demarcating the maritime border in a manner enabling the cultivation of natural resources in the area. The two sides held their first round of talks on October 14th and are expected to hold another round tomorrow. Moving on now, the U.S. presidential election is just days away, and Donald Trump is making a last-minute push for peace in the Middle East. Speaking to Fox News on Tuesday, Trump says there could be several countries, even the big ones, that will join the Abraham Accords and normalize ties with Israel. That would follow the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Sudan, who all recently opened diplomatic relations with Israel. Trump said there were more on the way without specifying exactly which countries they were. Do what we have 
five, but we really have probably nine or ten that are right in the mix. We're going to have a lot. I think we'll have all of them eventually. Meanwhile, the United States is effectively lifting a ban on U.S. funding of Israeli scientific research projects conducted in the West Bank and Golan Heights. Last year, the Trump administration effectively backed Israel's right to build West Bank settlements by abandoning a long-held U.S. position that they were inconsistent with international law. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, signed agreements earlier today at a special ceremony in the West Bank settlement of Ariel. And we will sign a revision that will eliminate the geographic restriction that prohibits the funding of American and Israeli joint research and development and cooperation over the Green Line. We are righting an old wrong and strengthening yet again the unbreakable bond between our two countries. This is an important victory against all those who seek to delegitimize de everything Israeli beyond the 1967 lines. And to those malevolent boycotters, I have a simple message today. You are wrong and you will fail. You are wrong because you deny what cannot be denied. And it seems like Israelis might be just as invested in the upcoming U.S. election as Americans. After all, the Trump administration's policies toward Israel seem to have had a huge impact on his campaign. A car convoy carrying U.S. Republicans living in Israel made its way this week to the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem in a show of support for Donald Trump bringing the race for the White House onto the streets of Israel a week before the U.S. election. What, what you see here today is one of the most amazing expressions of popular support for President Trump and, and, and Vice President Michael Pence and the whole Republican Party. They love Israel. We love them. We love America. Today, I'm here because we believe that Donald Trump is a hero. Check it out. Donald Trump is a hero not only because of what's going on with Bahrain and Israel peace, Sudan and Israel peace, United Arab Emirates and Israel finding peace. I don't know what the deal of the century will bring, but I do know, I do know that this is a time where we have to stand together as friends and as allies. Our top story tonight, the High Court of Justice in Israel today hearing petitions aimed at ousting Prime Minister Netanyahu from his office. Just one of several petitions with the Israeli High Court today in deliberations. The petition ultimately aiming to establish the possibility of forcing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to resign in light of his pending corruption trials, at least as soon as he becomes alternate Prime Minister. As part of Netanyahu's unity agreement with Defense Minister Benny Gantz and his Blue and White Party, Netanyahu is set to step down as Prime Minister in November 2021 to become alternate Prime Minister. And it's at this point that opponents want to force Netanyahu's ousting. But to do this, they need to first prove that the power-sharing deal underpinning the government unity is unconstitutional. The petition, being authored by the Movement for the Quality of Government in Israel, the left-wing Meretz Party, and the Guardians of Israeli Democracy organization. Now, aside from challenging the constitutionality of the rotation agreement itself, petitioners also argue that Netanyahu will lose his diplomatic immunity once he steps down to become alternate premier. Though Attorney General Avichai Mandelblit, who himself indicted Netanyahu, recently told the High Court that he views the alternate position as constitutional. But at any rate, the court hearings are being broadcast live to the public, the timeline for a decision being unclear. Finally, meanwhile, attacking the coalition from a different angle, opposition leader and Yeshatid party head Yair Lapid has announced that if a national budget is not passed by next week, then his Yeshatid Telem unity party will initiate a proposal to dissolve the Knesset with a vote of no confidence next Wednesday and return to a fourth round of elections. Well, both Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Donald Trump promised that there would be more to come, and the proof is in the pudding. The African nation of Sudan now becoming the third Arab Muslim state to normalize with Israel since this summer. And this news also is coming as Israel's cabinet approves the second recent peace agreement with Bahrain. A momentous phone call to start the weekend. United States President Donald Trump congratulating his counterparts in Israel and Sudan on their newly established relations between the two countries. The third historic Israel-Arab peace agreement in as many months, and Israel's fifth peace agreement with an Arab country in general. I just congratulate all of you. The state of Israel and the Republic of Sudan have agreed to make peace. This is for many, many years they've been uh, at odds, to put it nicely, and to normalize their relations. Uh, this will be the third country where 
We're doing this, and we have many, many more coming. We have uh, — they're coming at us hot and heavy. In the coming weeks, they will meet to negotiate cooperation agreements. You saw that happen with UAE and Bahrain recently in agriculture, technology, aviation. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also welcoming the new and latest U.S. brokered peace agreement, commenting specifically on Sudan's historic political turnaround and its likely effect on the region, especially given that Israel and Sudan have technically been at war for the past 70 years. בחרטום בירת סודן, הליגה הערבית הכריזה על שלושת הלאווים מישראל, לא לשלום עם ישראל, לא להכרה בישראל, לא למשא ומתן עם ישראל, כל זה שינינו כמובן. Meanwhile, aside from just opening trade with Sudan and hurting Iran's illicit trade routes, this agreement also includes some important lines in the sand, specifically that Sudan will officially side with the West against Iran, while labeling Iran's proxy in Lebanon, Hezbollah, a terror group. This being a major step forwards from Sudan's support of Iran until at least 2016. Then Sudan has also agreed to compensate certain American victims of terror attacks and their families to the tune of $335 million. In return, the United States will remove Sudan from the United States' terror sponsor blacklist, which includes the lifting of crippling economic sanctions and the opening of new ties with the United States. Uh, يعني إذا تم من ناحية بتاعت نحن كربنا أنا بقول كلمة كربنا الاتفاق يعني من ناحية اقتصادية سياسية بفتكر علينا إحنا ممكن نمشي لقدام بصورة جميلة جدا جدا لأنه أبسط حاجة يعني مثلا عندك لو مسكنا مرور الطيران عبر 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 السودان للدول اللي إذا مسكنا مثلا الدول الأفريقية نحن بنجني منها الكثير ودي بتقوم تصلح لنا في الاقتصاد بتاعنا وإذا مسكنا يعني من ناحية سياسية يعني نحن علاقتنا مع فلسطين محفوظة يعني بدون أي بدون أي تغيير بدون أي يعني يعني لعب من خلف خلف الدول. Now as for which country will be next in line to normalize with the Jewish state, Israeli Mossad chief Yossi Cohen is hinting that Oman is on the horizon, with Saudi Arabia waiting for the results of the United States elections to show their hand. Meanwhile, watching the Israel-Sudan events unfolding through a microscope, Israel's Sudanese migrant and asylum-seeking or refugee population is waiting on pins and needles to see what lies in their future. Though of the roughly 6,000 Sudanese nationals still living in the Jewish state, most seem to be excited. If Israel and Sudan are in the world, it will the Israeli government has long had a conflicted relationship with its African asylum seekers and migrants. Internal political battles ongoing over the nature of the migrants' arrival, with many arguing that they've come escaping extreme hardships and human rights abuses, while others argue that they've only come for better economic opportunity. Either way, with a new, more moderate government in Sudan, many fears of return have been put aside anyway. <laughs> Still, for many others, of course, the news is received with mixed reactions, specifically from those involved with ongoing asylum applications. I'm very happy about the peace agreement that it seems is going to be actualized between Israel and Sudan. And we are very happy about the progressive situation in Sudan. We hope there will be a real peace and Sudanese asylum seekers will be able to return home safely. Yet there is a need to remember that Israel cannot deport asylum seekers with open asylum claims. Now, as Israelis continue to fight against the coronavirus pandemic, so too does PLO chief negotiator Saeb Erekat, whose condition has continued to deteriorate, according to hospital officials. Erekat was admitted to the Hadassah and Kerem Medical Center in Jerusalem last week, suffering from severe complications with COVID-19 on top of his weakened immune system resulting from a lung transplant in 2017. Since then, he's been connected to an ECMO machine to support his respiratory functions while receiving concentrated plasma with anti-COVID antibodies. Still, reports say that his condition is taking another turn for the worse, with a fungal infection now being identified on top of his already complicated diagnosis. 
And hospital administrators are stating that in addition to these medical issues, there's also been some deterioration in other organ systems, as is commonly seen in critically ill COVID-19 patients. But Erekat's family is still holding out for hope. My father tested positive for corona three weeks ago. Uh, he has been hospitalized uh, since one week. Since then, he's been uh, intubated, connected to the ECMO machine. Uh, three days ago, he underwent bronchoscopy, which thankfully uh, revealed that there is no bacterial uh, infection, no viral infection, uh, but he has one kind of fungus infection and uh, that's most probably due to his uh, low immune status after his lung transplant three uh, years ago because of the drugs he's taking to suppress his immunity. Uh, my father is a fighter. He's fighting this fungal infection and hopefully he will make it. Uh, all the Palestinian people are praying for my father. We thank you all, the family of Saleb Erekat. We thank you all, our Palestinian people and everybody all over the world asking about my father, praying for him. Uh, he'll keep fighting with your prayers. I would like to thank all the doctors, Professor Stephen Nathans, Professor Kramer, Professor Vernon, and all the Arab doctors around us following up my dad's st status and praying for him. Hopefully things will take a better way. Uh, thanks for everyone. Thank you. In the meantime, Israeli development of a coronavirus vaccine is progressing on schedule. The Israel Institute for Biological Research, or IIBR, is confirming that phase one human trials for the vaccine will begin Sunday, November 1. And they will continue through to the spring until receiving approval for, for use on the general public. The head of the IIBR, Shmuel Shapira, saying in a statement that the final goal is to produce 15 million doses of the final so-called Brie Life inoculation for residents of Israel and our close neighbors by this summer. Still, the IIBR, an organization under the umbrella of the Defense Ministry, is far from a final product, with Phase 1 trials set to begin with just two participants, growing to 80 over the month of November, and then again to 960 participants over December. Then finally, at the same time, should another vaccine beat IIBR to the punch, Israel is also in talks to acquire those drugs. Several dozen vaccine candidates around the world are already also in clinical trials, 10 of which are in advanced phase three human trials involving tens of thousands of participants. Now, until Israel's vaccine is completed, thousands more may become infected. And in the ultra-Orthodox or Haredi Jewish sector, the outbreak has consistently been at its worst. So how are synagogues evolving with the pandemic? According to a new Hebrew media report, at least one in five yeshiva or Jewish seminary students has contracted COVID-19 in spite of taking part in government-approved capsule programs starting in August. That's upwards of 7,000 students out of the 35,000 who participated in the program, though a September report by Haaretz News reveals that many of these students violated the capsule regulations, leading many critics to renew attempts to block the reopening of these religious schools after they were closed again for the second nationwide lockdowns in late September. That said, a new look at several synagogues is now showing an evolution in the response to the pandemic, at least among some in the Haredi sector. Recent images captured from a Jerusalem synagogue showing attendees all in masks and separated by plastic barriers. This, the apparent fruit of negotiations between the government's coronavirus authorities and top rabbis, in which officials have agreed to allow a return to schooling, but only if capsule and isolation programs are actually adhered to. The program will also be dependent on a continuing decline in morbidity, and the capsulized groups of students will have to remain in their isolation until after Hanukkah in December. All right, now speaking of health research, an Israeli researcher and a group of interdisciplinary scientists at Cornell University have now just revealed a new method for brain imaging. And of course, it's based on our old friend, the zebrafish. You may recall that earlier in September, Israeli researchers were using zebrafish in cannabis research. And now the fish are being studied again, this time in efforts to better brain mapping technologies. And there's a good reason for this. As the researchers explained, the zebrafish are a great standard model for vertebrate brains, as all vertebrate brains are essentially the same in terms of basic structure and function. So what's the new method? Well, plainly put, specialized lasers are used in extremely short pulses that interact with the molecules in the brain and scatter light from other tissue layers. So essentially, as Jerusalem College of Technology professor and research collaborator Dr. David Seinfeld puts it, we can now shine a laser beam through fish scales and still see the neurons behind them, creating a very high-resolution image even deep within the brain. And this could be a game-changer 
in the entire field of neuroscience. Well, we know you've been wondering how you can recycle all those used surgical masks you've been wearing to protect yourself against coronavirus. Turns out they're perfect for growing seeds, cuttings, and bulbs. That idea comes from Pablo Cherkasky, director of the KKLJNF Jewish National Fund's Gilat Tree Nursery in southern Israel. There's been a dramatic uptick in littering masks, and the JNF are suggesting repurposing them for something productive. And if any of you decide to plant a seedling in your leftover mask, please take a picture and send it to us at info at ILTV.TV. Your tree might just make it onto television. <laughs> and now for something a little bit different. The normalization agreement between Israel and the UAE, as we've mentioned, has led to historic collaborations on so many levels, including sports, specifically soccer, or in Israel as it's known, football. Yesterday, we learned that the two biggest football organizations in the two countries will work and play together. Here is the official announcement. خطوة جديدة لبناء جسور العلاقات الرياضية المتينة اتفاقية هي الأولى من نوعها يسر رابطة المحترفين الإماراتية أن تعلن اليوم عن توقيع اتفاقية تعاون وشراكة مع رابطة الدور الإسرائيلي لكرة القدم أنا جايف نرغاش لطول خلق بمعامات زي بوانو خطمين على السكم أشير يهوه جشر بين كدورجل الإسرائيلي لكدورجل بيخود أميرويوت دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة وطن التسامح وملتقى شعوب العالم كرة القدم كانت دائما السبيل الأهم والأسرع للتقارب بين الشعوب وهذه أواصر التعاون التي نهدف إليها من خلال هذه الاتفاقية And that's it for ILTV's weekly review. I'm Aaron Porras. See you next week.